Over the last 25 years, I've had the privilege of interviewing and highlighting some truly interesting people. Everyone who is anyone, both the famous and the infamous, from presidents and their first ladies to kings and queens, movie stars and pop stars, captains of industry, heads of state, sports personalities, innovative entrepreneurs, and some pretty fascinating everyday people. Today, I am proud to introduce you to Dr. Ellen Killebrew, a cardiologist who loves her work and is proud to have witnessed an explosion of information and change in the manner in which medicine is practiced, adding to the longevity and quality of life. Dr. Killebrew, it's a pleasure to talk to you today. A pleasure to talk to you as well. Yes, ma'am. What actually made you decide to become involved in healthcare, and why did you choose cardiology as your specialty? Well, at the age of 13, I got very ill. I had a gastroenteritis, and my mother tried her home remedies, and none of them worked. And so finally, she called the family doctor who came after office hours, came in, opened his magic bag, and out came some vials after he examined me with a stethoscope and pressed on my tummy, he gave me a shot in my butt and gave me some pills for mom to give me. And the next morning I was alive and well and starving. So I all my it was always I was 13 at the time, and it was always on my mind that maybe I'd like to be a doctor. Of course, in my whimsical way, I was gonna have a horse and buggy and do every kind of medicine. Well, reality slipped in. In between, of course, there was college and boyfriends and more boyfriends, and I slipped a little. But when I got back to college, I took a course in biology, and I was hooked. So I switched majors. My dad had to sign a form that I could do that, and I switched to pre-med, and I was on my way. And medical school was tough. Uh, there were four of us. And we three of us live together. But I, I love it. It has been the most rewarding career I can even think of. Cardiology is so rewarding. For one thing, I don't I'm not restricted to gender. I'm not restricted to age. Except for babies, I pretty much am on my own. I did see some teenage students, uh, patients rather. So it's been a good, it's been a good go, very rewarding. Dr. Killebrew, I'm curious. You said there were only four of you, and I know that means there were only four women in your class. What is it That's like? What was it like to be a part of a medical school class where there are only three other people who are your gender? I have to imagine during that time was very, very challenging. It was extremely challenging. That's why the three of us that lived together supported each other because we had to. The men didn't appreciate us being there. <clears throat> and it was four years of heavy duty paranoia. I always thought I was gonna fail. We all did, but we supported each other. We kept at it and we were determined. And I think that's part of it. You know, you have to have the passion and you have to just say, I can do this. And you can. That is absolutely wonderful. I know that you became an assistant professor early on in your career. Did you always see yourself becoming a teacher? Or was that something that you discovered through your work experience? That's something I discovered through my work experience. When I initially got a job, it was hard to get a job as a woman cardiologist in San Francisco. And most of them said, we don't take women. Well, I got a job at Kaiser, and it was a very small Kaiser hospital, and they had trouble finding cardiologists. So I think I was a warm body, and I could do the deed. So I was accepted, but at that time, Kaiser wasn't the Kaiser giant it is today, and the quality of doctors in some cases wasn't up to what I had remembered. So I decided to start teaching at University of California because that would be the stimulus I needed to keep my brain alert. And it worked. And I love that too. And I see you've actually authored and co-authored some journal articles and chapters. Talk a little bit about them because that really and truly does speak to your teaching and professorial background. Okay, the first two articles I wrote were necessary to get through the cardiology fellowship. You had to publish. 
But then the others was because I wanted to become a fellow of the American College of Physicians. And that's tough because they require uh, service. They require academia, faculty, and they require papers in addition to your practice. So I was fortunate enough to, to get together with some doctors at UCSF who were happy to help me write these papers. And that kept me interested in academics. I had a blend, it was wonderful. Never got boring. As I, I hear you talking, I hear the passion for medicine and cardiology in particular. And um, I shared with you a little earlier that I am a heart disease survivor and I like to add thriver to the end of that, a heart disease survivor and thriver. So speaking to cardiologists is one of my favorite things in the world to do uh, because for all practical purposes, you all saved my life. And um, as the National Volunteer for the American Heart Association, I love to talk heart health. Why don't you talk a little bit about our favorite subject and tell the audience about cardiovascular disease and more importantly, how to prevent it and catch the early warning signs? That's my passion, especially in women. But there are so many things you can do in lifestyle to change what's going on. One thing is regular exercise. Obviously, uh, keeping your blood pressure controlled, not smoking. Um, a good attitude helps as well. And just to think about the things you can do. Eat healthy because diabetes is a big killer, women as well as men. Hypertension, smoking, diabetes, these are all the things you can take care of by yourself, by taking your meds and abstaining from bad habits and keeping your weight under control. These things make a difference. I've exercised all my life, including now at home. Uh, as a, a big proponent of the Go Red movement for the American Heart Association, I always simplify it and say, let's eat less and move more and don't smoke. OK, if we can just do those three things, you can reduce the instances of cardiovascular disease exponentially. Absolutely. I totally agree. And, and I love that you're talking about exercise at all ages. Um, how important is it to make sure that you stay physically fit? And that does include making sure that your diet is one that is both nutritious and healthy. Well, for one thing, the more you move, the more you move. You know, if you sit, I found this out during the pandemic. For the first couple of weeks, I was at loss. I didn't have a job. Okay. I couldn't get out. I couldn't do anything. And I found myself turning into one big blob of flab. Oh. It was terrible. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> I know. I don't believe you in the least tiny bit. <laughs> but it didn't feel good. You have to get up and move. So taking out my mask and walking around the neighborhood, I don't have a dog, but if I do it, I can walk him. So I found friends with dogs and we walked together. And it's just, it's so nice to get outside and it's so nice to be moving. And I find that my balance is better, I'm stronger. And it wasn't, we weren't meant to be couch potatoes. Ma'am, who have been some of your mentors when it comes to medicine? Believe it or not, surgeons. The uh, first surgeon was when I was in med school and he took me under his wing. And I remember him so fondly, he was a general surgeon. And then when I moved on to Colorado for my residency, I was the only woman in the Department of Medicine. And I did a rotation in surgery and I loved it. Tried to change majors, but they wouldn't let me. Then when I got to my fellowship, I met a Dr. Gabodi who was a very famous cardiac surgeon and a sailor. And he took me under his wing and I used to crew the sailboat and he would tell me, Ellen, get all your letters, continue, continue, do everything you can to get your letters, which is why I went after the cardiology fellowship, you know, the American College of Cardiology, American College of Physicians. I wanted my letters. So I got my letters and he just kept pushing me and he was such a good friend. And so then another surgeon named Dr. Norman Shumway, a very famous cardiac surgeon at Stanford, took me under his wing. And so they encouraged me so much 
not to go into surgery, but to continue and do the best you could. And Dr. Kilbrew, you've mentioned that you were a witness to an explosion of information and change in the way that doctors practice cardiovascular medicine since you started your career. I can imagine that there's just been a wonderment of what we can now do with cardiovascular medicine. Why don't you take us through some of those changes? Because you've literally been a witness to history. I have. When I was in medical school, we had no coronary care units. We had no defibrillators. Mm. We had no beta blockers. All we had were wards. And wards are where there's like a porch with just beds lined up next to each other. Kind of reminds you of a barracks. And when a person came in with a heart attack, he was put in a private room and left there. And they needed his privacy, so he was closed. So often we'd make our rounds in the morning and the person would not be with us any longer. Mm. He died during the night. We didn't have any monitors. And so that was a terrible thing. And so that was in med school. And then when I got to Colorado, they had finally had a coronary care unit where you could see the patients from the nurse's station. That was new. So if they had an arrhythmia, you could just, you could intervene. There was monitoring. Defibrillators came along. Beta blockers came along. Uh, we didn't know how to do CPR. It was a hand re- a rip, uh, raising kind of maneuver. CPR came along. So all of these changes came along. We used to have to watch young coronary patients, people of your age, usually male, die because we had nothing to do. And they'd have another heart attack and another heart attack. Their muscle would get weak. They go into heart failure and die. Now we can avoid that. Yes, indeed. Cardiac mortality went from 35% with a heart attack down to three. That's, it's just overwhelming, you know, and I, I get very excited about these kinds of changes. One, I take the beta blockers. I know that those are because of the science and the research of learned people and clinicians through the, the work of the American Heart Association. I love going to scientific sessions and learning about the new things that we're able to do for cardiovascular patients. You really and truly can now survive and thrive after uh, a cardiac event. Um, you know, Dr. Killebrew, I see your passion for this. Um, I would love to hear what information you think would be the most important for someone considering a career in cardiovascular medicine or even medicine in general? Because I want as many good doctors like you uh, coming through the ranks. Thank you. What I would say is pursue your passion. If you have the passion, there's going to be roadblocks, but you can, you can leap over them and you can do so much good. And I think the thing to the forefront should be the patient. Patient care is all that really matters. All of the rest is, is, the workload is tough, but the patients matter. And that's where the reward part comes, the carrot and the stick. The reward is how the patient looks at you if, and, the, you know, depending, it's a quid pro quo. How you treat them, they treat you. And that's the reward in my life. The people who live longer because of interventions and just the interaction between patient doctors is a really wonderful thing. You know that. My doctor and I, we have such a close relationship. I mean, when someone holds your heart in their hand, you have no no choice but to love them. <laughs> and uh, and I'm just very grateful for just the brilliance of the doctors who helped me and who are helping so many of what we call our heart sisters out there, women who have suffered from heart disease and who have survived and thrived. So Dr. Killebrew, I'll ask you finally, What's the one thing you'd like the viewer of this video feature to walk away with today? I think the thing I would like to get walk away with is that it's a noble profession and that we can do so much more and that we should, and if we have the passion, pursue it. Pursue your dream because there are so many people out there who could be good physicians if they were given the opportunity. And we've at least improved from the gender point of view because it was like 5% when I graduated as a cardiologist, and now it's about 30%. 
that's gone up. And the amount of doctors in med school from 5% to 52%. We have that much of the population, why not? And women are good caregivers. They're nourishers. I have to tell you, uh, that is the best way to end this when it comes to your passion and what I hope will be many more women's passion. Just go for it. You have the opportunity, you certainly do. And I thank you for your service. I thank you for your passion. I thank you for your work in keeping us all heart healthy. Um, I always say, Dr. Killebrew, she who has her health has hope and she who has hope has everything you ever need so thank you very much thank you thank you and thank you again thank you